Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us here today. We're going to get started in just a minute as folks are trickling in. So thank you for being here. We'll get started in about one minute. Welcome everybody, folks are flowing in. We're gonna give it maybe 30 more seconds for more people to arrive, but thank you so much for being here. We'll get started in just a second. All right, let's get going. Well, thank you everybody for being here today. Welcome, it's great to have you with us. My name is Mike McLively. I'm the Policy Director of the Community Violence Initiative at Giffords, or a National Gun Violence Prevention Organization named for former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, who herself is a survivor of gun violence. I'm sure many of you are aware. Uh, Gabby was shot back in 2011 while hosting an event for constituents in Tucson, Arizona, and has dedicated her life to ending gun violence in the U.S. At Giffords, we do work around the country to address all forms of the gun violence epidemic. And with our CVI work, we're particularly focused on increasing awareness of and support for community-based solutions to violence. It's our core belief at Giffords that CVI strategies from, out, from street outreach to hospital-based violence intervention programs are an essential part of the solution to America's gun violence epidemic. We also understand that these strategies rely on the heroic efforts of brave men and women who are healers, conflict mediators, crisis responders, and trusted credible messengers who are putting themselves in harm's way in order to make our community safer. It's our mission to make sure that America at all levels of government and in the private sector are supporting and investing in the field of community violence intervention and prevention in a way that is proportionate to the incredible importance and value of this work and of the individuals who are doing it and have been serving their communities in many cases for decades. So this is the second in a four part webinar series on community violence intervention that we've been putting on in partnership with the amazing folks at the Northwestern Neighborhood and Network Initiative, also known as N3. Our first webinar, which is available to watch in case you missed it, uh, was an introduction to CVI work in general. Today's conversation will focus on the state of the CVI field and the frontline workers that are the heart and soul of this work. As part of our efforts to support the field, Giffords and many other groups in this movement have been working to systematically understand the needs and challenges that frontline workers are facing. In a national survey we conducted last year with intervention workers in Oakland, Los Angeles, Baltimore, and Chicago, we confirmed what many of us already knew. Frontline workers are underpaid, face both direct and vicarious trauma from their work, and the vast majority had worries about, about job security because of lack of funding. This obviously needs to change. Today, we have an incredible panel of individuals who are working in this space and will explore in much greater detail the needs and challenges of America's frontline workers. This conversation is being recorded, so it will be available to be viewed later. Uh, and throughout the conversation, we, we are encouraging folks to submit questions. We want this to be a robust discussion between both the panelists and the audience. So please feel free to participate throughout and you can use the chat feature to submit questions and comments. I also want to just briefly mention, since we have many folks here, we want to make sure we're getting the word out. And since we're talking about funding, the federal government has a $50 million new program called the Community Violence Intervention and Prevention Initiative, or CVIPI. We're going to put a link to a fact sheet that we put together about this opportunity 
That's for both community-based organizations and cities, counties, and tribal governments that are seeking to implement or expand community violence intervention strategies. Uh, again, this is a $50 million opportunity with grants that are due in mid-June. So we wanna make sure that as many folks uh, as possible are aware of this opportunity and hopefully able to leverage it. And this also comes for the first time ever uh, from the federal government support around technical assistance, capacity building for smaller grassroots organizations, and the creation of a national resource center for community violence, which is an exciting development. Obviously, still not the level of investment nearly that we need to see in this country, but it is a step forward. And we want to make sure everyone's aware of this opportunity. So without anything else, I want to introduce our incredible moderator for today's discussion, Mr. Dallas Wright, who is a research project manager at N3. Dallas is a lifelong Chicago resident with over six years of experience in the city's nonprofit sector. While he was working at Inner City Muslim Action Network to support the health needs of Southside families, he earned an MA from DePaul University uh, in clinical mental health counseling. His ongoing research interests include violence reduction, public health, and in incarceration's impact on psychological well being. Dallas, I'll turn it over to you and thank you so much for leading today's important discussion. Thanks, Mike. And uh, I also would like to introduce uh, the other members of this, of this panel. I'm really excited for this conversation today. Uh, I also have with me uh, Jalen Arthur, the Director of Strategic Initiatives at Chicago Cred. Uh, we have David Hero, an Assistant Professor at University of Albany, which is part of State Universities of New York, and Andrew Papakristos, the Professor of Sociology and Faculty Director at N3 at Northwestern University. Um, and as Mike mentioned today, we're going to discuss uh, several exciting issues and findings related to the current state of community violence intervention, CVI workers, uh, the implications for the field, uh, and what roles stakeholders at both the local and, no local and national levels can play on the continued growth of this really crucial work. Uh, but before we do begin, I'd like to just level set a bit as folks continue to kind of uh, to trickle in uh, and talk a bit about what CVI is and why this uh, approach is really critical at this current moment. Uh, community violence intervention, right, CVI, it's an approach to public safety that relies uh, primarily on individuals, concerned individuals native to the, these communities that they're in, who are willing uh, to accept really the role of peacemaker and, and of healer, like Mike mentioned, uh, and to work tirelessly and reduce community violence. Uh, by engaging the individuals who are at highest risk of being victimized and or uh, participating in violence. Really, uh, as long as there's been community level violence, homegrown kind of peacemakers have arisen in a really organic way uh, to, to redress harm. We're talking uh, dedicated parents, faith leaders, uh, justice involved folks, uh, survivors of violence, all, all, all types of people from all backgrounds who have really stepped up to risk their lives uh, over the decades and years to, to try to prevent others from falling into the cycles of, of, of deadly violence. Uh, something called street outreach uh, is, is really a key pillar of the CVI work. And street outreach is, is, is not a new thing. It's an old idea, really, that dates back to the mid 20th century, the 50s, 60s. Um, but it's maintained the principles of CVI at its core as it continues to evolve uh, to present day. Uh, street outreach workers, uh, they're, they're known as uh, what we call credible messengers. Uh, in other words, well-respected individuals and figures in their communities whose word is trusted and who often share many life experiences with those individuals they're attempting to engage in the street. Uh, they really, they serve as the vanguard in a lot of ways. Uh, they're really cru crucial frontline workers uh, for these outreach efforts who try to, disc, uh, to to reach people who've been historically disconnected from institutions and valuable networks of social support. And so through these relationships that they build uh, over time, really uh, based on sincerity and persistence, uh, street outreach workers are able to, in ways that other uh, entities uh, in the community are unable to, they can connect individuals with impactful resources and help to diffuse group conflicts that tend to drive community level violence. As a nation reckons with the impacts of uh, punitive and harsh criminal justice approaches, and uh, many cities grapple with recent surges in gun violence, 
uh, really now is, is more urgent now than, than maybe ever before to really deepen our commitment to CV high approaches. Uh, these are practical means to address gun violence without a dependence and over-reliance on state actors, as I mentioned, whose roles have traditionally been uh, reactive, punitive, and, and resulted in a lot of collateral damage in communities already facing high levels of violence. Um, at its core, this work is about human beings. Charts and graphs and numbers uh, we have to have and we'll, and we'll discuss, but I, I wanna kind of really elevate the point that uh, underneath all of that, really, this work is about human lives and human beings. Uh, and so if we can disrupt these cycles of retaliatory violence and, and, and help individuals choose healing rather than picking up a, a gun, that really is success. That's what success looks like. Um, and, and that's, again, that, that's what CVI work fundamentally aims to do is to empower people who are experiencing violence uh, to help and to connect with young people in particular and other individuals who are traumatized and trapped uh, in these cycles, offer them a different way forward. Um, and as we continue this work, uh, it's extremely important to also build the knowledge base that supports its innovation and supports its growth. Uh, in, in short, we really have a lot to learn uh, if we want to see success and if we want to succeed. Uh, we're investing uh, not enough, as Mike mentioned, but we are investing significant dollars. We're building infrastructure and professionalizing uh, the workforce but we still can't answer some basic questions like how many CVI workers are working in the country right now? Uh, how do those totals compare to what the community's needs are, right? Or what sorts of trainings and support are, are, are required to really make sure that, that uh, CVI workers uh, have the tools they need to succeed. So uh, I'm really excited again to hear from the folks on this panel. They all have uh, vast experience, deep experience with CVI efforts in several cities across the country. Um, and they've worked tirelessly to help establish a research base, a knowledge base that focuses on and also centers the experiences of CVI organizations and the experts that help drive them. They've helped build and implement uh, the national survey from Giffords, which you all uh, can, can, can access in the chat, and also a new survey, uh, VIEWS, the Violence Intervention Worker Study, that, that, that's, that's covered over 90% of the street outreach workers currently working in Chicago. So with that said, uh, I'll go ahead now and, and, and we'll take it to the panel um, and, and they can share more about what we've learned and what we continue to learn. Uh, I wanna actually start uh, with, with, with Jalen. Uh, and if you can kind of just, just help us understand right now, Jalen, what do we currently know? And also what are some things we don't know about CBI workers in the United States? Got it. I appreciate that, uh, Dallas. And uh, first and foremost, good afternoon to all peace to all and um, definitely um, humbly appreciate the opportunity to present special thanks to Giffords, the N3 team and the uh, panelists. And so uh, just to start off, just a little context before I jump in, um, you know, there was a time where I faced the reality of spending life in prison. And so um, like I, I really counted as a blessing from the true God to have had an opportunity to set up outreach practices um, on an international scale and um, what I've seen is uh, <clears throat> if you're serious about stopping shootings in any community, you have to be able to work with shooters and potential shooters within those communities. And so when you think about who's best equipped to actually um, serve those individuals, those groups highest at risk, I'm, I'm really starting at um, the ending place where Dallas left off. I mean, we are talking about individuals um, who have, you know, they're from the neighborhoods that they serve. They have a tremendous amount of credibility, courage. This is not for the timid, the weak, the, the, the people that are easily frightened. Um, you you got to have license to operate. You, you have to have lived experiences. These are individuals that understand the culture of violence in their particular areas, which can be different. And they know how to network um, across, you know, high risk networks. And so when you think about just the job description of that, you are actually asking, you know, the job description requires people that have actually transitioned away from violence, transitioned away from the fire, we're actually asking them to jump right back in the fire. And this, this the irony of it is that um, there's a growing body of evidence that, that suggests that, you know, street outreach, CVIs that work with high-risk participants, they're reducing you know, vi victimization and arrest of those participants that they're working with. 
But the reality is doing this work by nature of the job description could actually raise the profile, the risk profile of the workers themselves and actually make them even more vulnerable for arrest and victimization themselves by virtue of getting in a line of fire. And so um, that is a starting point. Um, I think there's the, the good opportunity right now, there's a lot of funding opportunities under this current administration for CVIs, for street outreach that is in the pipeline. This is a great opportunity for the nation and for, for cities impacted by violence. The reality is um, there's a lot of knowledge and experience um, with this population. It's mostly in people's heads. Um, a lot of it is not documented, some is. I think there's a lot of conclusions that's been drawn, a lot of speculations, but the reality is there are huge limitations and gaps in what we actually know in terms of accurate knowledge on the workforce, which is expanding. And in order to support, to better support this workforce, we, we absolutely you know, need to, to, to have this knowledge. Um, in order to also, you know, strengthen the quality of safety, of implementation, worker supports and better develop the workforce. All of this is critically important. And so just acknowledging the work that's been done right now from Giffords and uh, N3. I think some specific examples and right now there's, there's not a citywide or a, a national or international database that has a lot of this um, information readily available. Um, to us so that we can actually react to it. And so um, some specific examples right now, Dallas stated one, um, and we started this practice a few years back um, in, in, in my capacity um, here, what we've begun to do some years back is start to actually do an accurate count of how many workers that you actually have in a workforce at any given time. Um, when we look kind of nationally and even internationally and pose those questions, you know, a lot of times, you know, um, you know, people have to go back, you know, and, and, and really get those numbers out. So it's not like housed in a database where it's readily available, how many actual workers exist at any given time, you know, community, city, national, international, these are very important numbers to have. When you think about the demographics, how many men versus women are working at any given time, you know, understanding the workforce and the needs you know, in relation to that becomes critically important. Even, you know, black versus Latino versus other becomes important. When you think about age demographics, you know, people make observations, but there's not a lot of, you know, data being tracked, you know, systematically across the board on age. And, and there's there's something that, um, you know, in, in, you know, nearly 18 years I've been doing this work. One, one, one analogy I always use is keeping up with the streets is like keeping up with technology you can become outdated in this field overnight. I'm not just talking about outdated in the sense of, um, you know, different violence trends and different cultural trends. We're also talking about, you know, new players, you know, and new cultures that are coming with this. And, and what, I've, what I've seen, what I've observed is, you know, from time to time, you'll have some teams, you know, that maybe every, everybody on a team is 40 plus, 50 plus, you know, those are teams which sometimes are more vulnerable for having, you know, some disconnects in terms of the culture of the violence um, with the individuals and groups that we're working with. For example, um, you know, th there's a strategy um, that, that, that I oversee in my capacity called 2020 Vision. It's a social media strategy. Um, what we learn just with this strategy and engage in a workforce, there's a lot of workers that are not on social media, but even a step further, don't even know how to navigate social media. When we're talking about IG, Facebook, and other social media platforms, why is that important? When you think about the, the level of violence that's instigated online, if you have workers that are not online, are not following, are not monitoring social media trends, then the detection of, of, of conflicts is, is compromised. And so, you know, th this is another key area where, um, you know, just even tracking age demographics and things of that nature can become important even to the quality of work. Another symptom that, I, that I've observed in this work, when you think about, I look at conflict mediations in two buckets, direct or primary and secondary. Um, what, what, what I've observed over time is, you know, if you, the primary or direct conflict mediation is when you're actually directly mediating with the individuals that are actually you know, involved in a conflict. The secondary is when you don't 
actually have contact or make contact with the people that are directly involved, but you know their father. Or, or the worker may say, oh, I know the father, or, or I know the mama, or I went to school with the uncle. The secondary mediations can also be very effective, but the reality, what you see, if over time, the number of secondary mediations are going up, the number of direct mediations are actually going down, then that could be sim a symptom that workers are becoming less connected to the population that we're working with. And so these are just things to, to be you know, looking out for when you're actually doing the work. The reality of the work, you have to constantly reestablish your LTO, your license to operate. You, don't, you come in with a network, you build relationships, and guess what? You know, people die, people get locked up, groups get apprehended, new groups emerge. And so you're constantly having to reestablish though your, your networks, reestablish your license to operate. And this can be a training thing needed for support. But again, these are things that we see um, even in age demographics, demographics. And lastly, on that point, even off ramps, when we think about the knowledge, even on education, training, how we're developing the workforce, you know, if they're if we're not developing our our workforce, then what happens is there's no off ramps. There's no you know opportunities to elevate beyond like a street outreach worker going up or even outside of this workforce going into a other a whole another line of work altogether. And so what happens? I've also seen situations where we've had workers that have in the average life you know shelf life of a street outreach worker I would say is about two to five years. Um, you know, but we have some workers that have done it much longer. Some of those are still some of our strongest workers. They may be in 40s plus still strong workers. But then we have some who started strong. Guess what? They're disconnected now, but there's no off ramps. There's no other opportunities. And so based on loyalty, we have some organizations that say, you know, well, look, they they've put their lives on the line. They worked with us, put in a lot of good work. We don't want to just you know, we don't want to just let them go, even though we know they're not effective now. Because then, you know, you know, are they going to be able to find other work? And so all of these things come into play when we're talking about capturing um, a lot of critical information. When we think about trauma exposure. How many workers have been shot, you know, on the clock, off the clock? You know what I mean? Have been killed on the clock, off the clock. A lot of times this type of data, the site knows it, you know, a community may know it, but it's not being tracked in a systematic way. This is critically important, you know, to understanding the safety risk and being able to mitigate those risks, really, really, really being able to provide the proper supports um, for our workers. The reality is the artillery, even for those doing this work, you know, 10 years ago and still doing the work, the artillery is dramatically different. You know, everything is automatic weapons, military grade weapons. So what we're seeing at every crime scene, you know, 20, 30, 50 shell, case, shell casings, multiple victims being shot, a lot of innocent bystanders getting shot. And guess what? More workers are also being shot and killed. So are we, are we, are we tracking these numbers so we can better understand again the risk there? We're still in pandemic. How many, you know, some, some sites began tracking the number of, of uh, COVID infections to the workforce, others did not. Others, we have sites where people, you know, got COVID once, twice, three times, whatever the case may be, workers went down, no one was tracking it. So what does that look like? you know, for a community, for a city, national level, what does the COVID infections look like? You know, th these are all very important, you know, things that we have to know. The, the secondary jobs, you know, as Giffords pointed out, you know, the, the number 60%, you know, making under 42,000 a year. This puts people, this put workers, puts workers under a lot of stress to actually acquire secondary positions, which waters down a quality, of the street outreach in the first place, because street outreach, you have to be flexible. You have to be able to be responsive in real time to situations. If you're working a secondary job, guess what? You're not available during those hours. So as, as seasonal shifts and things begin to shift, it becomes a problem. And then, and then even, you know, workers are tired, they're exhausted, they're burning out quicker. And so the reality is there, there's a lot of pay differentials in terms of that. And there's a lot of places where no one's getting cost of annual cost of living increases. Are we tracking this? If you're if if we're if they're not getting cost of living increases, they could be making you know a, a reasonable amount right now. Maybe it's on par with the with national levels. But guess what? Year two, year three, year four, they're making the same amount. Guess what? They're making less money now. So so all of these like are we tracking these these particular trends? You know, last a last point I'll just bring out in terms of tracking data. 
think about rear think about arrest you know we've had workers that have been you know arrested or rearrested um while serving as you know cvi or street outreach and and by the way i do want to say i think this is you know even though this is, often makes headlines you know the 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 the, the relapse or 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 arrest um, percentages for our workers is, is very small, you know, but, but the reality is, you know, if rearrest happens and it, if it doesn't go public, if it's not in the media, what can happen is, you know, because of fear of funding, Giffords also pointed out um, in that study, you know, 93% of the workers concerned about losing their jobs, you know, for funding interruptions. And so when you think about, you know, the, the harm that, that a worker arrest can do and has done in the past, you know, what it does is, you know, because of a lack of education, you know, a, a lot of times, you know, what sites may want to do is sweep it under the rug if it wasn't made public. And so we're, we're not tracking this in a systematic way. Why does that become important? Well, this is also, this is, again, important to how we actually support our workers. How do we, what, what, what are we putting in place? to reduce the risk for that acknowledging that we're putting our workers, you know, right in the line of fire for being arrested, for being victimized. How many of those arrests are related to group level type of sweeps or RICO Act things where, you know, in the beginning on, on one side of the coin, people are being um, <clears throat> praised because of their relationships to a group that they're working with. But then if we don't understand, you know, how that what that really looks like, how that's playing out. And then you have workers that get caught up in sweeps or get caught up in criminal prosecutions, you know, maybe not just, you know, let's take the criminal, you know, um, activity. Let's say that's off the table, but it, they could get caught up in it just because of the relationships. And so, you know, these are all critical things, you know, that we that we're not we're not tracking in a universal manner systematically. But tracking this type of information actually puts us in a position, especially in light of more resources coming down a pipe, to be able to better support our workforce, to be able to better develop our workforce, to better provide better training, and also to provide better education to other stakeholders as well, so that this is a, a, a healthy, you know, very professional, uh, professionalized um, endeavor. Yeah. And so yeah, there's a couple really, really interesting points there. I wanted to, to one, just to jump in and try to digest some of those. Because okay. uh, you talked about, you started out really at, at the national level, right? And you raised a lot of issues, whether it's from demographics to trauma, it's the levels of violence exposure and, and trauma, uh, financial situations that yeah. people can be in, right? And then just kind of even trying to dig deeper in terms of uh, the issue of arrest. And and, and, yeah. and and folks having having be back involved in the justice system, and yeah. all really really crucial issues to your point, like you said, that we have to really begin to track if we're going to try to scale this work up. Um, and so, I, for me, that seems like a really really good pivot because I want to be able to kind of turn to to Andy and David here, uh, and then yourself as well to be able to talk about an example of of a, of, of an attempt to dig a little deeper and start to track some of these metrics that you've mentioned. Um, and that uh, effort I referenced earlier was the VIEW study, the Violence, uh, violence Workers Intervention Study. Um, and so Andy and David, if you could just kind of quickly talk about where did, how did the idea, tell the story about how the idea of the VIEW study kind of was born uh, and why is it so important uh, right now to do something like this? Yeah, thank, thanks to Alice and Jalen. Thanks for, for setting the stage. And, and we're going to mix it all up here in, in just a second. And, and before David kind of talks about the making of the survey and the doing of the survey, just, just a couple pieces of context about how we approach the whole project. You know, everything Jalen just said about the workforce uh, and going back to something Dallas said about how long we've been trying to do this work. Uh, there's a there's an older researcher, Matt Klein, and David Hero reminded me of this when we started working on this that said, look, the, the program is the worker and the worker is the program, right? And so if we are serious to Jalen's point about stopping violence, engaging people with lived experience, engaging the expertise from communities, not just engaging it, amplifying it, boosting it, but if we can't answer these basic questions that Jalen's laid out there, that the Gifford study is showing us, that our work is showing us, right? There's not another workforce out there that, that we don't understand that with, teachers, law enforcement, hospital workers, nurses. I'm sure there are many other 
populations I'm missing that we don't know about. But when it comes to this work at a time when, when gun violence is surging and we want these things to work and have, we have to focus on this workforce and centering that in discussion is crucial if we're serious about building violence prevention infrastructure. That's the first thing I wanna say. I wanna say something else, a second point, which is about how as researchers, uh, we have chosen to go about this project and, and we continue to hear and think and talk about what it means to do community engaged research, which is, you know, who are the experts, not just in understanding the sort of what it will take, but what is to understand it. And every city in this country has a university that's probably done something to communities they shouldn't have done. And how do you get past that levels of trust? Because these basic scientific questions, how many workforce, Jalen said, the, the average year was two and a half year, two and a half years. I trust Jalen, but we don't actually know that, right? We don't know how this population ages. We don't know if the 40 year old outreach worker has been doing it for 15 years since he was 30, because there's no 30 year old or 20 year old to take their place, or if it's just kind of what's shifting in this field. So as we're investing, and as we're continuing to professionalize and support this work, the basic science becomes more crucial than ever. And when um, you know, I returned to Chicago, I was born and raised in Chicago, I returned in 2018, you know, um, Jalen and I were talking about the spike in, in violence in 2016. Uh, and there was a lot of movement around trying to get Chicago's rate lower than 399, which is the lowest number we ever had. You know, we were, we were focusing on that outbreak of violence. Of course, no one anticipated 2020, but what we saw, and I just wanna thank our partners for continually inviting me personally and our team in this space was this hunger to do something different, not just around practice, but about understanding practice. So what we did, and, and I'm gonna hand this over to David in just a second, is we said, we need to understand these things. Jalen, I wanna recognize Chris Patterson uh, and the Institute for Nonviolence Chicago and the rest of Chicago cred, who helped us think through and design a survey from the ground up, right? David's gonna talk about the process of how we did this, but, but we actually started from the people doing the work. What did they wanna know? What do we as researchers know? Cause we know some stuff, right? How can we build off what we know in other spaces, adapt it here? What are the most pressing issues? Is it about supervision? Is it about pay? Is it about housing insecurity? Is it about all of these elements that make a healthy workforce? And not just that, a healthy workforce of organizations that are largely black and brown that we wanna succeed. We don't wanna set them up to fail. We wanna set them up to succeed. So understanding that work and understanding that workforce was, was really the first you know, impetus for you know, what, what we call the VIEWS study, uh, you know, which stands for, and I'll, I'll get myself out of the way here, the, the Violence Intervention Worker Study. And I'm gonna just pass it off to David really quickly about the genesis of the survey, uh, as well as the process of trying to, to actually find, interview, and, and talk to in this case of Chicago, nearly 200 professionals that are in this space every day. So David, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. All right, hi everyone, thanks. Um, thanks to everyone for joining the call. Thanks to my fellow panelists. Um, uh, the survey, as Andy mentioned, was a long time in the making. My own, my own um, experience with street outreach goes back to the late 90s, actually, uh, working in, in Boston um, and Really, the study the the study has been in my mind for at least ten years. Uh, I recall talking with um, with Andy a, a decade ago to Leah Rivera, who, who I know is on this call. I, I talked about it uh, way back when, who I used to do uh, outreach work with and would tag tag along in the South End. Um, and really, the survey was built up about a, a by a bunch of different impulses that came from different eras uh, in in street in street outreach research. Um, and from different contributions from different kinds of places and cities. So um, the first impulse of, of course, as, as folks have mentioned, is to try to understand who are the people that do this work, um, but not just, but moving beyond the generalizations, right? Moving beyond the stereotypes for whatever truth those stereotypes hold, right? That we think about outreach workers, right? As, as mostly men of color, mostly, you know, formerly incarcerated or gang involved, there's heterogeneity within that. Um, we saw it in Boston, right? There, there's, uh, the musician, right? That, that's it within that. There's the former combat veteran, you know, with with uh, U.S. Army experience. Uh, there's a someone like Atalia Rivera, right? Who's a uh, a a young woman that, that was able to connect in in really deep ways uh, with the young men that were out there. So, uh, trying to understand this this 
uh, diversity and heterogeneity within the experience of being an outreach worker. And that includes, by the way, you know, folks that were coming from an organizing background or a youth, you know, worker background uh, that were very effective outreach workers. Um, in Boston, uh, as part of my work on, on the evaluation of the of Street Safe Boston, uh, one of the questions that emerged was, you know, what makes an effective outreach worker? Who are our effective outreach workers, right? And to do that, we need to know more about, you know, who these folks are you know, systematically. Um, in Chicago, there were questions that were raised around um, professionalization, right? As Jalen mentioned and, and, and others have mentioned. Um, what training can we offer? What standards should we have? Uh, how does supervision impact outreach workers? How do they use data? But most importantly, what does outreach look like as a career? You know, what is the career trajectory of an outreach worker? Um, is it something where folks can move up, right? Or is it potentially, you know, a dead end job for some folks? And as Jalen mentioned, there's there's a lot of people that maybe have given a lot to the field, um, and we have to ask the question, you know, what has the field given them, right? What has it prepared them to do in the next phase of their lives? Um, and what what impact does this work have on the people that that do it professionally and personally? Um, and then finally, the, the, the last impulse I think was understanding a really complicated work environment, right? That's different from place to place. Um, I know, you know, many of you on the call, right, are, are from other places. Uh, I have to remind some of my, my fellow panelists that Chicago is not the center of the world sometimes. I, lo I love you guys, but uh, uh, for everybody else out there, I I'm with you. Um, and that things vary, right? The, the, the work looks really different. The violence, the patterns of violence look really different in different places. Um, but really, how do, how do outreach workers navigate a complicated work environment filled with trauma, filled with violence, uh, and doing it with a really uh, limited set of resources? So started about in 2019, we, we immediately reached out to, to Jalen, who we had partnership with, right, and Chris Patterson at the Institute for Nonviolent Chicago, and said, what do you want to know about your workers? You know, what is it that, what is it important that we have data on to inform policy? And we came up with a huge, you know, huge list of things, most of which, you know, Jalen has mentioned. Um, but, you know, we tried to make it as comprehensive as possible. And with the survey, in, in partnership with Jalen and Chris and some of our other outreach partners, we worked every line of the survey to see that it would be interpreted properly. Uh, we figured out how to design it and, and make it work in Qualtrics with our friend Teddy Wilson at SUNY um, and how to administer it online and, and uh, administer it during a pandemic. Right, and we field tested it with our friends in Albany and Boston, and integrated their feedback in it. So it really was a team, a team effort. Now, creating the survey was a tough job; it was an intense job. But we knew administering it would be the real work, and that's where uh, you know we really need to give a tip of our hat to our partners, especially Jalen and Chris, because we wanted this to be a research project. All of us. When I say we, I'm talking about all of us. You know, Jalen and Chris, who are authors on our first study paper. Uh, we wanted this to be a research product, product that was truly representative of the violence intervention community in Chicago. And to do that, we knew we needed to have a widespread buy-in, right, and widespread participation. Um, and so folks like, uh, we got rolling with INBC, we got rolling with CRED, um, and then as we got going, organization by organization, uh, folks started showing up for us and believing in the survey and getting more invested in it. So folks like George Matos, right, comes to mind. But there's a, a dozen others who really put the survey on their back, who saw the value in the survey um, and wanted to bring it home to their, to their, to their team. Uh, and the more that folks got involved, the more buy-in, the more interest we got. And what I'd say to close before I th throw it back to Andy on this, on the some outcomes or uh, some findings from the study, um, this was a 200 person study, right? A two, basically with a 93% response rate. And for that's an incredible research feat, you know, not to big up ourselves, but that's an incredible research feat. But more than that, I actually think that it's an incredible organizing effort by the outreach community in Chicago. Uh, so a tip of the hat to our partners on that, and we couldn't have done this without you. So Andy, I'll throw it over to you to talk through some results. Yeah, and I'm gonna uh, keep my face off and, and keep this slide up for just a second to David's last point. I have never been a part of another research effort that had a 93 or 94% response rate. And outreach workers are during a pandemic, during an uptick in gun violence, getting the buy-in, taking 90 minutes. These surveys took 90 minutes to talk about intense stuff, as you're going to see in a second. This was the dedication, not just of, of our, our team, which did a great job. Dallas was doing interviews. Our whole team was doing interviews. But, you know, Jalen, David, supervisors reaching out, where's so-and-so? Are they going to do this? Going to the, you know, 
tracking people down. Like that was, that was intense. And that was something we could not have done if this were just a straight researcher oriented survey, like getting the buy-in, getting people that actually wanted to do the survey again, <laughs> getting people who wanted, like, did you talk to so-and-so people that may have been, you know, outside of our purview. It was really just a, a unique opportunity that continues to show the sort of real deep dedication to the, um, to the, to, to the, to the sort of research. So, but just to quickly answer a question that just came up, they were paid, they were compensated for their, their time. Um, and so they got it, they got a gift certificate, a cash, you know, cash gift certificate. Um, would we like to give more? Of course. Um, but we did as much as we could and we're going to kind of keep trying to do that. But, but briefly, I just want to go over some of the key results and the working paper was dropped in line, but but the results are important for thinking about the work and there's a lot more to come. There's a lot more perceptions that are gonna be coming, experiences that are gonna be coming. Um, not surprisingly, you know, the majority of, of the outreach workers in Chicago were, were black or African-American men, um, about 80%, um, which again is, is important. We cannot under, under sort of sell the importance of gender and the role of women outreach workers that kept coming up time and time again in the interview. So there may not be many of them, but there's a growing population and one we need to learn explicitly more about, uh, as well as the multiracial uh, outreach workers in the Latino community, right? The Latino community in Chicago is strong and deep and their outreach presence also goes back 40, 50 years uh, and violence in those communities, you know, it does not get enough attention. And so we're trying to really pay attention to that workforce as well. Uh, not surprisingly, it had already been mentioned, uh, Jalen, Jalen was right. Uh, just to point out, but the, the average age of an outreach worker in Chicago is 44 years old. Look, I'm 46. There's a reason why it's 44. But what we don't know is either of those 44-year-olds have been doing it 15 years, 16 years of their brand new 44-year-olds, or whether we, we need younger people. And I'm sure Jalen in the Q&A will talk about new efforts, training and mentorship efforts like FLIP, which are trying to recruit staff into these spaces. But, you know, what's the proportion? How many young people, how many sort of middle-aged people do you need? And, and what is their future, right? How long can you stay an outreach worker? How, where do you go from there? Supervisor, um, you know, we're still, it's only the first wave, but we got a good snapshot of what the workforce looks like. What I wanna talk about now, and this is really, I think will be the impetus, it's the impetus for our first paper, which, which David had mentioned and is in the chat box, but also, the thing that gets talked about as it should be, but we need some numbers on, which is what are we talking about of a job where we knowingly place people with a history of trauma uh, and, and we're putting them in the space where they're gonna be exposed to gun violence. The, the first thing I wanna stress is that outreach workers are quite literally first responders. 80% of the individuals in our survey, 80% of outreach workers in Chicago, because this is a census basically, get to a scene of the shooting before other first responders. So they are literally the first. In many instances, I don't have the numbers in front of me, sometimes they administer life-saving first aid, right? So 80% of the time, they or 80% of respondents reported being on the scene of a shooting first. 73% saw a deceased person at the scene of a shooting. So they're showing up, they're seeing people in, you know, harmed and injured, and they're seeing people die right in front of them as they're doing their job. And in many cases, and we're still learning about this, the same blocks where they might've been shot 20 years earlier, right? The same block where they've seen others killed and injured. So they're getting exposed to this on the job. And more than that, 60% have seen someone shot at doing their job. And 32% have seen someone shot and hit by that bullet while doing their job, right? This is the work. The work places outreach workers in positions where they're, they're, they're witnessing violence, they're experiencing violence. And of course, one of the things, and again, we have another paper that, that we just finished, it's not ready for consumptions, but over half of outreach workers have, have experienced the death of a participant. And I think David will talk about this perhaps later too. This is unique. They're not just first responders. They stay with individuals after their moment of injury, after their moment of pain. They, they get them into services. They're building relationships. So this 52%, this is, this is a relation. These are people they've worked with and gotten to know, uh, and that's really vital. And the last thing I'm going to say, uh, which is if you're putting them and they're exposed to violence, the outreach workers themselves are in harm's way. And, and we've seen in reports from Baltimore of outreach workers shot and killed in this last year. When we asked these 200, nearly 200 outreach workers in Chicago, 20% have been shot at 
while conducting this work. And 2.2%, almost 3%, depending on you know, how we're looking at these numbers, have, have been shot and hit while doing their job. 2%. You know, and by the way, there are no comparable numbers because going back to what we do and don't know uh, about outreach workers in this workforce, we haven't collected this information. This exceeds the rates of, of uh, injuries related to assaults of many other first responders. Uh, so this is, a, this is a job of individuals who come from the community, who care about the community, who are putting their lives on the line to do the life-saving work of the community. And this is just from one snapshot. And, and that's kind of, that's why I just like to leave the, this, this last part. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. I, I, go ahead, Jalen. No, no, no. I was just going to go, go ahead, Dallas. No, I was just, uh, it's just a trip seeing those numbers again, because yeah. I hadn't revisited them in quite a while. And uh, every time I do see it, it just kind of takes me back to some of those conversations, difficult conversations we've often had um, over the course of that study. I wanted to kind of open it up to the group and just ask, you know, seeing these numbers again and, and just recalling the things that we did learn, both from the Gifford study and also especially from views. What does this, what do you feel like this means for the, for the, this, the field? What feels most actionable uh, to you all right now based on what we learned? So, so, so a couple of things jump out to me um, in, in, in terms of just tying both the Giffords and the uh, N3 study, which are both critically important. I mean, I think just starting first with, uh, with Giffords on um, the, the, one, of the, one of the things cited there was 93% of the workers felt like there wasn't enough workers um, you know, supporting them in a the community. And so I think this is, this is an actionable item. I think um, you know, one, one critical question is, what is the proper dosage? you know, of workers in, in, in a particular community. And really, you know, me and Andy have had these conversations um, in the past, really trying to, you know, figure out a way to uh, more accurately, accurately arrive at that. I mean, I see a number of teams across the nation who are incredibly stretched. And, and, and when, there's not a lo when there's not enough workers, what happens is they're, uh, they're constantly in a reactive mode. It's difficult to even get in a proactive strategic mode because you're constantly responding to fires and, and you're burning people out at an accelerated rate. So I think that's one thing, that's something actionable as these resources are coming down a pipe and adding to the workforce to expand it, something we can look into. I think the other thing, um, you know, looking at the N3 study, this 44 average uh, median age um, for, for outreach. And, and, and again, I wanna be clear, even on some of the age comments I made earlier. I mean, what I've observed I would say, and this is a personal, a professional bias, some of the strongest teams are those that are balanced, you know, that has some, some of the younger workers, you know, you have some middle-aged workers, older workers, um, you know, because the reality is, I mean, I think even just tying some of the re-arrest stuff, you know, a lot, of, a lot of agencies are, you know, have some fear in hiring younger, because even though the younger workers are a lot of times they have more intel, they're, they're more closely connected to what's going on in a culture, what, what happens is they also are more vulnerable for getting dragged back in and getting arrested. So a lot of a lot of times, you know, organizations are fearful of hiring younger workers. But, you know, what, what, what this says, though, is, you know, the younger workers need more support. And so more mentorship for some of the middle aged ones that's been around a little bit longer. So this is this is just something that's important for us demographics um, wise. But one one last point on age, and this is something I want everybody to be conscious of when you have a team that's just 40, 40 plus, 50 plus, what you do is send a, you send a message to the community and to the population that you're working with that you basically have to age out of violence. You got to wait until you're 40 plus to get out of violence. When you have workers on your team that's in the same age bracket as the population we're serving, it actually inspires them, Let's gives them hope that, guess what, we can make change right now. We don't have to wait until we're 30 plus, 40 plus after we did a 10 year stretch, 20 year stretch. That's, that's critically important and being a message that you bring. Uh, just a couple other important points. I would just say um, the Gifford study talked about the stick, stick, significant difficulty in workers separating personal life from work life. Um, the reality is, and even in the N3 study, we captured the number of workers living in the communities that they serve. Outreach has for decades, you know, praise that as, as a strength, you know what I mean? Workers living in the same community that they serve. The reality is it's gonna be very difficult though, um, and this is a good thing, but it's gonna be difficult for them to separate work 
from personal life when when you're living in the fire in the community and people know your your role so you're always going to be getting activated um for that so this is just something just for us to be um aware of in terms of training supports and and, and things of that nature um lastly i'll just say in and in three there's some other studies not even i mean in in this view study even like um incarceration the length of incarceration you know some of that stuff was in the study this becomes important as well you know keep not every single CVI or street outreach worker does has been incarcerated. You know that that that's even though the majority have that lived experience. And so the support that some somebody who's never been incarcerated that's coming into the work versus somebody that did twenty years and now they're a, a, a new street outreach worker, or somebody that did two or three years and now they're a new street outreach worker, the level of supports may be dramatically different. And so, in the same way that you know male and female counterparts, the, the, the training supports and things of that nature becomes you know, critically different. And so all of these are, in my mind, um, Dallas, these are actionable items that we can be really you know, um, baking into the supports, the training, and, and the education, you know what I mean? And the recruitment, you know what I mean? As we're recruiting new workers, you know, what that looks like. I wanted to, jump in on something that J Jalen said, and it's it's one of the things that we've been talking a lot. I, I will begrudgingly admit that Chicago might not be the center of the universe, um, but around this issue of what's the right level of workers, right? So in Chicago, there are about 200 to 225, 230 workers. In contrast, there are 12,000 police officers, 35,000 teachers, 5,000 firefighters and EMTs. So if we are serious about investing in an infrastructure that's based in community violence prevention, that is to serve the city of Chicago, 200 is not enough. I'm not willing to say what the right number is, but I do wanna say one word of caution, which is one of the things that, that this work on the ground, as well as the survey and work being done by others and right now, is um, we just can't hustle to hire workers, not train them, not support them. Um, you know, that's one of the things that I think we're, we want to caution against. Are we taking care of their safety, their health, their mental health? Do they have the backroom support? And, and right now, because we're in the midst of, a, of an outbreak and an epidemic, people are, want to fund programs, people want to invest in CBI, and we need to do that. But we cannot forget the support you don't see on the front page, the backroom support for staff, right? The work, if the workforce is the intervention and the intervention is the workforce, keeping the workforce healthy and safe is so fundamental and understanding that as we scale up is the trick. And, and I had mentioned this in a different panel, oftentimes an outreach worker described it as trying to build, build a bridge at or building a bridge as you're trying to cross it. And then everybody on the side wondering like, why well, are you going to make it? Um, and what's happening here is, and the reason I'm bringing this up is mainly because what expectations are we putting on CDI relative to building a workforce and supporting it, right? Is it even reasonable to say with 200 workers in the city of Chicago, it would have an impact on the homicide rate that is gonna capture the front page headline? It's actually not, right? In fact, whether or not the participants do well, whether the workers do well. So part of what we do as we're thinking about CVI works is we need to level set, what is the expectation of the impact of the workforce we have, 200. And then as it gets bigger, maybe that expectation changes. But that's important because if what we're going to do is say, you know, these programs are going to quite, quite literally live and die by a homicide rate, um, which is not the right way to measure the impact, we, we're, we're, I'm worried that we're going to set them up to fail. And I think that is one of the things that we really need to be cautious as we're continuing to expand is are we expanding in a healthy way for the people who are putting their lives on those front lines? Do they have the supports they need? Uh, and I think that's that's a great conversation to be having. And just to follow up real, real quick on that, Dallas, is, you know, and, and Jalen, um, you know, we are in this this moment where we it seems like this is eager to expand. Right. And even those of us that love this work have to acknowledge right, that, that the work's not perfect. There's still a lot we need to know. Right. That's where we started. Um, and I think one of the questions that's raised by this research, this round of research is one. You know, are there ways that we can reduce worker exposure to violence without pulling them out, right? Without reducing services to communities that really, really need them. And by that, I mean, you know, 2% of our workers, more than 2% of our workers have been shot, right? Our friends in Baltimore had three workers killed 
in a 13 month period, right? Are there ways that we can meaningfully reduce risk while still doing the work, right? That's, a mean, that's an important question. That's on the direct side. The second question it raises is about exposure to violence for clients and recognizing that workers, um, they're part of a caring profession, right? They've, they've experienced a lot, the loss of a client. And that, that loss we show in this other piece of research is coming out of the study, um, really impacts their mental health. Uh, and in fact, the loss of a client really drives uh, the secondary traumatic stress responses of workers to the point where they can, they can even be exposed to PTSD uh, by that exposure. So what ways can we make this workforce? How can we support them? How can we make them more, more healthy? And by part of that is how can we do things that re will reduce exposure to violence, but not uh, water down the work? Yeah, but an another point, uh, Dallas, I would just say, you're going back to this uh, Gifford study on the 86% concern about losing their jobs um, due to funding interruptions. I mean, I think the, you know, it's it's our responsibility, especially as resources are coming down a pipe. We need, mo we need multi-year funding level commitments. Doesn't mean that, you know, each worker, you know, you're getting a guarantee as long as they're doing their work, obviously. But, um, you know, you know, these types of funding strings where you're, you're there for six, six months, six to 12 months, and then it's interrupted, you know, we've been able to interrupt that cycle, um, you know, thanks to a, you know, a, a, an enormous effort, you know, with PSPC, a number of local funders, and, and a lot of, you know, now the city, county, state has, has kicked in. But the reality is we need multi-year multi, multi -year funding commitments so that, so that staff are not un, under the heavy burden and anxiety that, you know, we're working today, but we may be out of work tomorrow. So we got to figure out, you know, what other what other means of support that we can um, leverage. So that, that that's one that I think is also, you know, something that's uh, actionable um, in the near future. Um, other than that, I just, I, I just want to just also say, I mean, I think, you know, the work of a peacemaker, this is, this is a noble position. Um, and this is, they deserve, you know, dignity, respect, support. And, um, and, and again, I just think, you know, the Giffords, the, in, the view study is just critically important. We're going to need to expand upon that um, as well, you know what I mean, um, on a national, international scale and go deeper. But this is this is really, th this is a critically important discussion that we're having. And I'm excited that, uh, that we'll be able to start applying some of these principles. Yeah, no, thank you all for that. And it's interesting how you all kind of converged uh, at a, a really interesting kind of forward looking point, right? The points about multi-year funding and the comparisons between kind of the, the level of staffing in a city like Chicago for outreach workers compared to, to police officers, firefighters, EMTs, and others. Um, it, it, I'd like to kind of to, to shift a little bit and talk about kind of given the- Hey, 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 hey Dallas, not, not, not to cut you off, I would, in my mind, I don't have data to support this. I, yeah, in yeah. my mind, probably the most dangerous professions right now in Chicago is probably one being a rapper, you know, two being an outreach worker, yeah. you know, three being a police officer, um, four probably being like a Uber or Lyft driver. You know what I mean? Like these are like very dangerous professions right now. And so definitely need a lot of support. Yeah, yeah. And so when that support, as, it, as it's coming and as we, you know, push for more of that support, I'm curious to hear from you all, what, how do you all envision the role of CVI street outreach uh, in the midst of the larger kind of uh, public safety or, or, or violence reduction sphere? How, how does that fit in with those other pieces? Well, I'll go, I'll go ahead and, and jump in. I mean, I think the other lesson we've learned, not, not from this, the VIEW study, but our just work these last four years, and again, I know David has, has seen this in Boston and other cities, is, you know, outreach organizations our neighborhood institutions, you know, the, during COVID, what we saw, and I, I'm sure this is true in other cities, is that it was outreach workers who were delivering PPEs. It were outreach workers who were making sure kids had the internet hookup spots. It was outreach organizations that started and pivoted to do food pantries and delivery. And they didn't get hazard pay. They didn't get any extra pay. They did it because it's their neighborhood. And so when I think about like the recipe of public safety, I think it's a, it's a, oh, I was going to go with a really bad metaphor that was going to get away, but it's a really key ingredient, if not like a base of the recipe, 
And in part, it's it's because they we talked about direct outreach, you know, the interruption, the mediations, the 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 peace agreements, those sorts of things. But that's they, that's just that is a big part of what they do. But it's not all they do. And then there's victim services, there's educational components, there's training components, and all those things get centered in this space. And, and I think it's important to recognize that that is a that is a neighborhood institution, and they are vital to any formula of public safety. And I forgot, Dallas, it might've been you, you know, most disputes never get called in anywhere. Most of the disputes get handled locally in the home and the family and the neighborhood and the block. We've known this for hundreds of years and the street organization, uh, the outreach organizations, you know, embody that and try to try to improve that. And so they are a key formulation. The right recipe though, I, I think that's a, a conversation we should be having. Thanks, Andy. Um, so we've been speaking for about an hour. I want to be able to, to bring in some of the audience questions. We have uh, a handful of really great, great questions that have come in. Uh, and so I want to make sure that we address those. Uh, the first one, kind of again, along this line of um, longer term support in the, in the expansion and growth of the space. Uh, the first question from the audience is, how can you push for a multi-year funding commitments or how do you make that pitch uh, when we're not necessarily seeing decreases year over year in homicides or shootings? How does that pitch work? So so, so I'll, I'll jump in on that question first and, um, and, and I wanna humbly just say, um, I, I don't have the solution for that. Um, this is what I can say, what, what has been done. Just looking at Chicago and again, acknowledging um, the PSPC funding, um, you know, it's a, it's a network of local funders in Chicago. And, and really, you know, probably since the spike in 2016, I would say street outreach in this city has really um, been built off the backs of that anchor of financial support. Um, before that, there were, you know, it was up and down, up and down. What, with this network of funders pulling their, their resources together, um, they were able to actually, you know, you know, really secure um, co commitments over time, you know what I mean, you know, year after year. Um, and so that, you know, you know fu the funding wasn't just um, dependent on public sector funding. Now, as we're getting, um, our public sector has been kicking in more and more. Um, I think that that's a, um, that's a question that, you know, people from the city, the county, the state have been tackling. And I think that, that there are, um, I have seen um, now funding commitments come down a pipeline, three years of funding committed to this issue, you know, two years of funding committed to this issue. We're seeing that now, even coming through the public sector from federal and state resources. And so um, it's, it, it can be more challenging sometimes city, but we are we are beginning to see that now. And so that that becomes really important to sustaining it. The other thing I want to say, um, and this is just really to challenge, you know, everyone more broadly, you know, if if violence is going up in any particular city, you know, apart from like defunding police efforts, there's never really a question that, you know, the violence went up or it went dr dramatically up that, you know, the law enforcement um, in that local community or, or district is, is going to be, you know, the funding is going to be stripped and it's going to be reduced to zero because the, the, the killings went up this year. When we look at, you know, CVI, street outreach and other non-policing strategies, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a strict reliance and dependability that people want to say, you know, if it goes up one year, then it doesn't work, cut it. Like that's that's not the right way to be looking at things, and we 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 have to the same way we can't be short sighted with funding commitments. We can't be fun, short sighted even with the whole um, the whole approach. You know what I mean? Um, and 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 understanding of you know how we get violence down over time and recognizing that this is a critical element of it. So you know if if there is a year that it spikes, we don't pull a plug. You know what I mean? You learn from it. You tweak. You, you become stronger, but you but you stay the course. And if we and if we don't have uh, stakeholders that are committed to staying the course, then you put workers in this unhealthy cycle of guess what? If 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 God forbid we have a spike, you know we all lose our jobs tomorrow. You know what I mean? That's it's just not the right way to be looking at this. This is not a we didn't get into this violent situation 
you know, overnight. And we're not going to get out of it overnight either. Like we have to be committed to a long term game. I think real quick, Dallas, on this outreach has to be part of redefining what public safety means. And public safety is not just about did violence go up or down, you know, year over year. That's not the way we should be thinking about public safety. We should be thinking about what does community violence inter intervention do? What does public safety look like in, in, in quote unquote safe communities, right? It looks about looks like healthy institutions. It looks like places where material needs are built. It looks like places where all the residents and citizens are integrated into the social fold, where there's quality services, where there's participation, um, where residents are organized and activated, right? Around quality of life and, and, and um, and safety, right, and and well-being, and I think that that's a thing that outreach can and should do, and we can't. Although violence is going to be part of it, and violence intervention is going to be a big part of it, as I put in the chat, you know, our folks in Buffalo right now are mending the social fabric right now. They're doing more than just violence intervention, right? They're meeting basic material needs for people who are traumatized, who've been harmed, um, and who now exist in a food desert and are providing them food. These are the things that outreach does. That is beyond strictly violence intervention, and honestly, I think we've done a, we've gone taken it as far as we can. Honestly, in terms of you know promoting violence intervention as the thing, we should be focusing on violence, but it's long term, right? It's long term, and it's about redefining public safety and outreach. And this strategy can be a critical part of that if we let it. So, agree, David. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Andy. No, I, I just couldn't say I, I couldn't agree more with what David said. I actually think that was a beautiful way to summarize away a lot of what we were seeing, experiencing, and looking at on there. And during the pandemic, during this most recent shooting, it also means having really serious conversations, not just with people on this webinar, but with people that have funding about what success looks like. And you know, if you're looking for validation and success, you can point to these things, of course, but also understanding that violence is, even at an individual level, it's way more complicated than individuals just making bad decisions, right? So we have participants in Chicago, for example, and Jalen knows many of them, including one from CRED, 100% attendance, got the job, got a high school diploma, and stopped carrying a gun and got shot from somebody else, right? Doing nothing, doing everything right by every metric that you could look at in any kind of evaluation, they look like a success. But if all you're doing is tracking these shootings, it looks like a failure, right? And, and in this case, it was the opposition that wasn't, wasn't involved in anything. Uh, but like we broadening that to neighborhood safety, community safety, you know, broadly also understands like what does what does a success look like? It means it means more than just surviving. There's this element of thriving that needs to be crucial in those conversations. I just wanted to really plus one David's characterization of that. Yep. And, and the only other thing I wanted to add, and I agree with both uh, Andy and, and David on both on all points there. Um, I think the reality is, um, you know, evaluation still is important, though. And it, this is why like N3 and you have a number of different evaluation arms that has to be um, baked into any strategy in any city. And, and that is not, that's also not a short term process. That's a long term process as well. And so, you know, we, we definitely have to tie what we're doing to some real evidence. You know what I mean? And that's how we tweak, that's how we expand, that's how we grow and learn. So that, that part is, is important and we're never gonna get to a space when we're when the main you know the, the core of the mission is reducing shootings and killings, where those two indicators are not going to be important, and so um, but these other the other context has been shared by the panelists is important here. Lastly, case in point, I mean you can look at a city city like Los Angeles, who you know at one point in time we're having more than a thousand homicides, you know with 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 you know, an enormous amount of efforts um, at every level, you know, um, to, to actually get violence, you know, under a level of 200 homicides. If we look at what's happened in the last couple of years over the pandemic, even cities like Los Angeles, cities like New York, cities like Chicago have seen resurgence. So does that mean we pull the plug and stop investing, you know, in these efforts on the ground? That, that's just irresponsible. No, all tremendous points. And I want to point out in the chat, uh, there is a link to a research brief that, that N3 published in 2020, uh, going into more detail about this, uh, the issues that David and Andy and Jalen are touching on, and just the multiple hats that outreach workers wear and, and their ability uh, to fill urgent needs uh, really uh, underneath tremendous levels of stress. Um, 
the next question I want to turn to from from, from the audience, uh, I think this this also ties in pretty pretty nicely. The question is, what sorts of skills do you all think that uh, stakeholders, organizations, uh, experts could help equip outreach workers with that would help them build the sorts of uh, desirable and transferable skills that allow them to either continue to ascend and can kind of root themselves more into the anti-violence space and become a leader or to even pivot to another profession or even just for own, their own personal benefit, you know, dealing with trauma, for example. Yeah, so I, I, I can jump in on this uh, first. Um, I think it's very diverse in terms of uh, the needs and even interest um, of our staff across the city, across the nation that are doing this work. I think um, there's there's opportunities that I have seen um, at certain agencies that actually um, allow their workers uh, tuition reimbursements, allow them to be able to uh, get you know higher level education and other types of training um, on the agency's dime. And that is, uh, that's, that's something, you know, when, when I've seen, you know, individuals take advantage of that, we've seen a number of our workers, you know, get, you know, bachelor's degrees and other types of higher level of education. And these are individuals that I have seen actually ascend into, you know, leadership positions, um, not exclusively, but many of these are ones who have ascended into leadership positions, you know, in this space. Um, some have actually started their own, you know, um, non-for-profits. Um, in the same space of work, and others have transitioned into, you know, similar similar positions, but maybe um, in a periphery in, a, in another um, field. And so, I mean, I think one thing is definitely um, making those resources available for staff um, as an important thing. The training and education, the access to that is critically important. And even thinking about, you know, some of our workers have, you know, backgrounds where there's like drug offenses, where even getting like federal support for education can be compromised. And so, um, you, you know, we, we really wanna remove those barriers and allow, um, allow for those things. Um, you know, secondarily, I would just say that, um, I mean, I think, I think this is also a critical part of a future survey. Um, just, you know, looking at some of the interests that, um, that many of our staff have, you know, and that, and that will change over time. Um, and then looking at doing a market analysis to understand, you know, what types of um, what types of fields are right, um, you know, for you know workers that that have certain backgrounds and and, and experience and and traumas and and other things, um, so that they even know what's available to them becomes critically important as well. Yeah, that's great. That's a great answer, Dallas. I'm going to add something else that can be done actually now given the state, some of the state of the things we know, but it should be a first and, and not a last thing, which is, you know, developing basic standards of training and practice that have been developed over years by outreach. So Chicago, for example, there's Metropolitan Peace Academy, which, which is really training and giving outreach workers some basic things that Jalen is talking about. Um, and I know that's happening in other cities. I don't know the names of, of those things. I know LA has a similar practice, but like really stand, taking the time as professionals, which is going on, and, and to train and to certify and to get them the skills they need, which by the way, oftentimes, and this is something we saw doing the interviews and surveys, this is the first time people have talked about trauma. They didn't even think trauma existed because they didn't even have a good chance to talk about it in their life when they, because they've been moving constantly, right? So even as they're going through the training to do the work that they're doing, there are these opportunities for healing and development, but there are best practices that exist that you can have as a baseline. We could start there. We could make sure that, you know, whether it's in cities and states across the country, the sorts of, you know, and again, what do other professions have? They have a, they have a, a network of practice where they share information. This is working in Baltimore. This is working in Buffalo. David's example in Buffalo, we saw that in 2020 in Chicago when there was, you know, tensions between black and brown communities. Who, who mediated that dispute? It was outreach teams that did it. Right. So what lessons can we learn from those things? And, and in fact, how do we share and support that? And I think there are some examples that exist right now that that could be a starting point. It's clearly not the ending point, but it's a starting point for some of the other bigger, hopeful things that we as we think about the, the health and safety of, of outreach workers. Thanks, Andy. I, there's 
quite a few questions actually and comments coming in from the audience related to uh, the reality really of, of violence intervention workers as first responders, um, kind of de facto, right? And uh, Andy, I know you kind of met, you, you referenced that finding that 80% of the Chicago outreach workers uh, said that they had been the first person on the scene of a shooting incident before ambulances, before police officers. Uh, and so given that what we're, what we're finding in Chicago and in other cities, the question is raised about, you know, we, we see a, a need to be able to, uh, to, to pay folks more and, and pay them commensurate and comparable to other violent uh, first responders. How do we get there? What do you all feel like is needed to really be able to, to, to make a significant change to that pay structure? So, so, so I'll just, I'll, I'll start on that. I mean, I think, um, I, I don't think that is as complicated as it sounds. I mean, we have, uh, we, we've addressed this um, with a number of community partners, um, even in, in the past three to five years. We had, we had some partners that were paying their uh, staff, you know, 20 some thousand dollars a year, 30 some thousand dollars a year. It's, it's really, um, you know, it's really just embarrassing. And, um, and, and, and there's no excuse for it. Um, these pay scales need to be adjusted. Um, whatever agency, interagency, um, you know, processes that need to take place to do that needs to happen. And then as new resources come in, um, we need to fund, we need to make sure that the budgets um, accurately reflect um, what the pay scale should be. And, and it's also a responsible practice to make sure that we're um, putting in, that we're factoring in cost of living um, you know, increases on an annual basis. Like these are things that we, in any other workspace, um, most of the time these things are happening. So there, there's, a, there's an adjustment that needs to happen for any partners that are below where we should be. There's, there's a process to actually make sure that there's cost of living increases. And then there should always be flexibility though for um, that, that accounts for experience um, education, things of that nature as well. I mean, if you if you're paying your worker 45k, um, and and that's a starting worker that just came, you know, fresh off the field, no street outreach or CVI experience, but then somebody that's that has five to seven years experience, and you're starting them off at the same, I would question that as well. So there should be, you know, there should be a minimum threshold, but there should always be flexibility for a range that that allows you to take into account these other factors. Thanks, Jalen. Um, uh, the one, the one thing ahead. I would add, the one thing I would add to that, is, is really valuing the work uh, as as a first responding role. And and I want to again, um, David Haro mentioned this in our conversation. Post first response or post responders, right? So this is a big difference. They don't just show up at the shooting. They're they're engaging with their participants and clients over extended periods of time, that's more like students, that's more like social workers as well, right? It's not, they don't just show up, mediate something, and then they're out. They're, they're actually investing in relationships. And so, but that saying yes, they are, uh, you know, that, that, that kind of constant refrain in policy spaces and public spaces that says they are actual first response, not, not figurative, we're not just saying it, they literally are doing that work. And PS, they're doing more than that. But actually valuing them socially as such, treating them as such is, is key. It'll change, it should hopefully change the dialogues too. Yeah, D D Dallas, can I just jump in on one, one, one yeah, thing? Please, please. Uh, just in, in terms of actually attracting new talent, and, and a lot of times this is younger talent as well. Andy referenced the flip strategy earlier. I mean, this has been a, a definitely a key mechanism for us in Chicago and for our listeners. I mean, flip is a, is a summer-based strategy. We're looking at hot spots. Um, that drive violence across the most impacted neighborhoods. We're, we're training, uh, we're identifying and training credible messengers that are active in those hotspots and giving them a paid stipend to actually maintain peace, non-aggression agreements across those hotspots. Many times these are individuals that are still actively engaged um, in violence, maybe one foot in, one foot out. What this allows us, what it has allowed our partners to do is it served as kind of a, an internship 
where we're able to kind of test out individuals on the ground, see what they're able to do, give them their first taste of doing violence prevention work. And what we've seen over a three year period, 86, um, 86 individuals from FLIP have transitioned into street outreach um, and other CVI type of roles. And so, you know, th this is this is something that I would just say in terms of agencies, um, you know, this is something just supporting, you know, strategies like that that allow you to actually test test it out. Um, I think it's just important um, for us as we kind of grow and expand the workforce. Definitely. And I'm looking at, we have about 10 minutes left. And so I think maybe time for a couple more questions from the audience. Um, this one, again, is, is we, we talked about valuing uh, violence intervention workers as kind of first responders, right? And we talked about that's a dynamic that's kind of that happens both on the street and also kind of uh, I guess on on payrolls. Uh, in terms of street dynamics and responding to incidents, uh, it's inevitable that violence intervention workers, outreach workers, are going to come into contact with police officers, right? And there's going to be some coordination there and some interactions there. Can you all talk about maybe how that dynamic has evolved over time and maybe some things that that we learned from the VIEW study related to outreach police dynamics. You want to start, Andy, then I, or, or David, and then I can jump in. Well, I think one thing, and I haven't looked at this in a, in a bit, so I'm working from memory here, um, but it's interesting. And, and don't, don't, don't quote me on this. I know we're being reported. We'll, we'll, this is subject to verification in the data. However, one of the things that's interesting is that um, outreach workers relative to uh, folks in the neighborhood that they work in uh, generally have more favorable relationships uh, or more favorable views on, uh, on the police, right? Um, and during their time as an outreach worker, for the most part, there's been a movement, outreach workers report that for the most part, there's a movement um, in their attitudes toward, pol toward police in that uh, they are slightly more favorable. Now, that's not all across the board, right? But, but ge in general, being an outreach worker um, gives you a more favorable view of the police. Uh, or th the more time you spend as an outreach worker, the more likely you are to have a more favorable view of the police. And I think part of that is just having, a, a, a again, it's not across the board, it's not perfect. But I think part of that is, you know, sharing a, a similar on the ground kind of first responder uh, perspective, right, of, of understanding how complicated doing real, you know, violence intervention work is, how complicated it is to be a first responder, how complicated it is to manage a scene, to deal with someone that's harmed, and that sort of thing. Um, so that's one thing that we've seen within the data, and, and, and Dallas and Andy, correct me if I'm wrong there, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. So, so this is something I, I would um, say on that particular issue. I mean, I think anybody who's been doing this work for any length of time, uh, especially, you know, five, 10 years plus, um, which you'll recognize not just in Chicago, but in other cities where there's been a sustained uh, CVI or street outreach presence. I, I, I think probably um, some years back, the further we go back, the more strained the relationship, um, you know, with um, and, and coordination with law enforcement has been. I think in Chicago specifically, um, we have taken some quantum leaps in terms of the professional understanding between law enforcement and street outreach. I think many, there are many um, within law enforcement ranks that are recognizing the value of uh, street outreach as you know, non-policing alternatives that can be effective in actually reducing violence and getting services to individuals that, um, that are on their radar. And so um, I think over time um, in, you know, L.A. and New York and other places, you know, have had experience with this. Um, and so there's there's a number of champions right now and there's a number of activities that are happening that actually, um, you know, that actually foster healthy professional understandings between these two delineated roles that share a common goal of reducing shootings and killings. And so like for one of those, I, I missed the regional coordination meeting. That's one of the meetings myself and a couple other colleagues uh, we facilitate where we're bringing violence reduction stakeholders at one table. You know what I mean? We have law enforcement, we have the city, we have street outreach workers, we have you know level one trauma centers, other community um, violence reduction groups, all at the same table, you know, strategizing around how do we reduce violence 
acknowledging the different roles that people play um, at the table. I think these are even the, the MPA, the Metropolitan Peace Academy, there's a piece of that where they have in the past brought in law enforcement um, to provide some education on um, some two-way education, really. There, there's more that needs to be done there. I know LA has done a lot of that as well. Um, you know, so I definitely acknowledge my colleagues, Mel and Susan and others who have been part of that um, in that space. You know, at the end of the day, um, you know, acknowledging the trend that um, that David is, is speaking of, there's still a there's still a ways to go. There's still a lot more work to be done. Um, there's a number. There's still a culture, you know, within law enforcement that has to be challenged um, as well. So I think we're moving definitely in the right direction with this professional understanding. There's been some amazing coordination um, with law enforcement. I mean, just re referencing even the flip strategy. They also just identifying the identification of hotspots, you know, they're sharing hotspot data, you know, hotspots that they're concerned with were in three, you know, evaluation arm, pulling, doing analysis to identify hotspots, and even our street intel, our teams are pulling that together. So we got three different categories of data to land us in the right spots. This is this is an example, you know, of what coordination could look like. But coordination not meaning, you know, if law enforcement is looking at street outreach for the value of, of, of being a confidential informant, then they're missing the whole point. That is not, that is not a role for street outreach. And so um, I think the education, I think, um, you know, I think just being able to do stuff on the ground and for people have to be able to see the value themselves. And I think, I think what we've been, what we've been demonstrating with the open and willingness um, on the ground is our, our value. And the the evaluation arm, last point, sorry, um, you know, like stuff like N3, stuff like the crime lab, stuff like other other evaluations that have been out there um, in a the past. Like these are these are also things that actually strengthen our credibility, um, you know, for being able to effectively administer these strategies. So all, all, all of it actually helps. And I think we're moving in the right direction. I'm going to add a, a very brief thing to what Jalen said and David said, but, you know, a lot of this hard fought progress in, in cities like Chicago, um, you know, and it has come quantum leaps. And I think Jalen described it. They, they've been so contingent on individual personalities and individual relationships. And for that to be sustained, it has to be institutionalized, which is what we mean when we're talking about infrastructure. So we've seen this in LA, we've seen this in Oakland, where these things, there's a pattern. This is what we do. When there's a shooting, this is how we respond. This is how we communicate with outreach. This is how we communicate with law enforcement and so on and out and social workers and victim response. Like it can't be just contingent on Jalen or you know Commander so-and-so because when Commander so-and-so get moves, organizations often feel like they go, they go in reverse seven years because they got to start all over. And meanwhile, people are getting hurt. So we've got some important lessons learned. The question then becomes, how do we make those things part of part of policy, part of practice, so that this is what we do. This is what we do in this neighborhood, in this district, when there's a shooting, here's how we engage. Better if you've got great personalities, but it can't just be contingent on one administration or one personality involved in outreach. It has to be, again, sort of a network, a collaboration, and it's gotta be practice. It's gotta be operating procedure. Thank you. Yeah, I think that, and that's a great, I think, place to land. It's kind of, it really is an all hands on deck effort. Um, thank you all. Thank the panelists um, and the audience, all of you all for contributing to a really valuable exchange of knowledge and insight uh, on such crucial work. I want to thank Giffords as well for hosting this really important space. Um, if, if you all are uh, interested in learning more about any of the studies or initiatives mentioned today, please do reach out. Um, and I want to remind uh, everyone as well uh, to please join us for the third installment of this series. Uh, it's scheduled for June 23rd at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, we're gonna continue to build on the conversation that we had today, as well as turn our focus to really promising efforts uh, related to kind of what we talked about, right? Providing needed support uh, for these community uh, violence intervention workers. So uh, stay tuned, more details will, 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 will be to follow. Uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all so much. Thanks, and appreciate the, the thoughts in the chat as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.